Seeking to extend his decade-long rule, Sri Lanka's president announces snap elections, but can economic success and memories of victory over Tamil rebels outweigh accusations of nepotism and near unlimited powers? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. On the one hand, Sri Lankan President Mahinda Rajapaksa has plenty to be proud of. Memories of his 2009 victory over Tamil separatists still carry some weight. And economic growth since then has been the fastest in South Asia. But Rajapaksa's popularity appears to be fading. His United People's Freedom Alliance suffered its worst performance on his watch in local elections in September and calls are growing for him to cut back his virtually unlimited powers as president and carry out democratic reforms. Rajapaksa has now called snap elections scheduled for January to stem the opposition's momentum, campaigning for an unprecedented third term in office, having scrapped a two term limit. Manal Fernandez in Colombo helps set up our discussion. The much-awaited proclamation by the president declaring his intention to seek a further mandate uh, for a third presidential okay. term uh, being signed off this afternoon. We saw a tweet uh, basically posted on the president's official account and this was confirmed by the presidential spokesman a short while ago. Uh, having declared this intention and signed the proclamation, the next step is for the election commissioner to set down a date uh, essentially for the nominations to be handed in and then for the actual election. I did speak to the election commissioner a short while ago before the proclamation and in terms of the time frames that this thing involves with the proclamation, uh, essentially nominations should be called between the 8th and the 11th of December and essentially if we're looking at the date for the presidential election, it would probably be between the 6th and the 10th of January. Now, the government pulling out all the stops, indeed, over the last day or two, we've seen the city of Colombo plastered with posters, with cutouts of the president, all wishing him well for a possible uh, third term. Uh, a very much a sort of an expression of confidence in the president uh, and his term. The opposition, on the other hand, uh, remaining very secretive about its common opposition candidate coming together uh, for the first time in many years on a sort of a common platform given the popularity of President Mahinda Rajapaksa, the opposition uh, admitting and accepting the fact that they would have to uh, put in all essentially their forces together in a bid to take on the president. Now there is also a campaign that has been going on from the grassroots uh, bringing out the fact that the president is constitutionally uh, not able to seek a, a third term. Uh, even a former chief justice has expressed this opinion that the constitution disqualifies the president the moment uh, he declares and is elected to a second term. However, the president has referred this issue uh, to the highest court in the land and has got the all clear from the Supreme Court. Let's talk about this more by bringing in our guests for Inside Story. In Colombo, we have Rajiva Wijasina, a member of parliament and an advisor to President Rajapaksa on reconciliation. Joining us from Dublin is Suren Surendran, spokesperson and director of strategic initiative for the Global Tamil Forum. And completing our panel in Colombo is Harsha De Silva, economic spokesperson for the opposition United National Party lawmaker. Welcome all of you. Rajiva Wajansina, why has he called for snap elections? Why couldn't he wait? I think one of the reasons he wants to have elections now is that he realizes that his popularity is slipping and the longer he waits, the less well he will do. But I also think that there's a very dangerous collection of people around him who are treating him as a sort of cash cow. You know, they've blockaded him from understanding the reality of what is going on in the country. And they sort of let him out of this fortress only in order to use him, because he is undoubtedly popular, mm -hmm. to use him to win elections. And the minute he'll win the election, if that happens, they'll shut him up again and go on their merry way. 
So I think it is really a great pity that he has gone for these early elections. Uh, our party told him that if he went for elections without the reforms, some of which he pledged himself, we would not be able to uh, support him. And that's why I say that, uh, you know, I'm very happy to be with Al Jazeera again, but I do feel that the panel is really balanced very much against the president. Interesting. So you advise him against it and you believe that he's being used to reach this aim of uh, calling these snap elections. Harsha De Silva, what is your response to this? I mean, is this a sign of confidence or weakness? Well, I agree with uh, Professor Rajiv Jai Singh that the president's popularity is dwindling, actually. You know, it's not slipping. Um, and therefore, he needs to somehow get back into power and hold it for the next, um, well, six, eight, I don't know how many years, because the law doesn't seem to apply. Um, the people, on the other hand, are finding it extremely difficult to make ends meet. So while on the one hand, uh, the president he realizes that he needs to quickly get it done in order to lock his next term in, uh, the people are determined uh, to not to let that happen. Uh, and that's why the opposition has now got together uh, for the first time in many years. Uh, and uh, we will be by uh, the perhaps tomorrow, uh, later tomorrow night, uh, announce who our common candidate is uh, to take on um, uh, Mr. Mahindra. Yes, because this will be a different dynamic for the opposition, won't it? I mean, you really do have to get together and there's going to be a certain amount of horse trading working out who is going to be the best candidate and how you can all benefit from this. Yes, I mean, we've been working on this for the last several weeks um, and even till you know, three o'clock in the morning, uh, this morning, uh, we were negotiating. And it is a win-win for all parties concerned because um, uh, by and large, vast number of people, both in government, in Mahindra Rajapaksa's coalition and outside, obviously, uh, who does not want to see him serve another term. So our coalition is going to consist of both opposition uh, members as well as those currently serving within uh, his coalition. Siren, would you like to see him serve another term? Do you think this is a, a good call, these snap elections? Well, I, I like to agree with uh, the, the my um, um, uh, panelists um, with me. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's strange that um, Mr. Rajiv Vijay Singh uh, kind of blame somebody else um, and almost uh, makes uh, Rajapaksha looks like uh, a, a captive of uh, others making that he has made this election now. He's called the elections now. The elections are called because uh, come March 2015, the UN Human Rights Council is going to bring out a damning report um, almost um, um, accusing the government under President Rajapaksha of committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. The economy is dwindling. The uh, foreign currency reserves are uh, coming down so much that the IMF has uh, demanded that the public expenditure is, uh, should be dropped dramatically. The inflation is going up. People can't feed their children. The security situation is poor. Uh, the judiciary is politicized. So somebody mentioned, one of the panelists, uh, with all due respect, mentioned about uh, Pre President Rajapaksha. Oh, no, actually, the, the, the introduction said that the President Rajapaksha went to the Supreme Court to get his um, third term approved. But this, the, the judiciary is politicized. There is no independent commissions anywhere um, in, in the Sri Lankan structure. The relationship with the India is at the lowest. The international community is looking for President Rajapaksha for political solutions. The Tamil people, um, a, 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 the, the most affected community, is uh, looking for a political solution, which Rajapaksha has been deferring for the last five years. The Muslim community, the most affected at the moment, Rajapaksha has made the Buddhist Sinhalese against the Muslim community. He is attacking the mosques. He has Bodhubala Sena, a government-sponsored organization, attacking the Muslims. The Christians and the Buddhists are in fight. The Tamil Hindus and the Buddhists are in fight. Not necessarily the people. The government makes it a, such a nationalistic state 
that if he waits for the right time for the elections, he knows that he's going to be beaten badly. Okay. So he calls an election, a snap election. And okay, that's the reason he's calling points, a snap election, not because uh, uh, somebody else is forcing. Excuse me, jumping in here. You raise many points, and I would certainly like to work through those a little later on in the program. But, Rajiva, maybe you'd like to respond to those accusations that rather this is a sense of a man who is losing his popularity, that he's getting very desperate and that he has to call these elections now, otherwise his future as leader is doomed. Well, that's precisely what I said already. But I think where I would defer from Suren is that I think the president does feel beleaguered and it's a strange combination of wanting to continue in office himself because obviously he thinks that he uh, is the best person for the country and he has certain achievements to his credit. I think it was very important that he got rid of terrorism on our shores and he did try to rebuild the North not as productively or let's say in consultation with people as he should have but certainly there has been a lot of development. But one of the reasons he does feel so beleaguered is precisely the confusion between this international pressure on him, which comes for a variety of reasons. In part, there's a lot of pressure on certain governments, and they've admitted it, to try and persecute him for war crimes. Uh, in part, it is because there is certain worry about his foreign policy. I think one reason it is important that Mahindra Rajapaksa does not win election is because if he wins, I think the consequences for our forces will be very negative. I believe that our forces, these in direct contrast, I think, to Suren, fought a relatively decent war compared with a lot of other people. And if Mahindra Rajapaksa and his foreign minister and the people who really control the foreign ministry continue with their completely absurd uh, attempts at confrontation with everybody. So it is perfect right to say that they are being very foolish about India, which were really very helpful to Sri Lanka in dealing with terrorism, but at the same time did so on behalf of the Tamil people who had suffered from terrorism. And I, I, mean, think I think Sri the Lanka question is certainly how he, he dealt with the Tamils towards the, of the, the end Tamils. of the war. Excuse me talking over you there. I just want to bring in Harsha De Silva very quickly. I mean, do you think the president believes that he is above the law because of those successes and because he's surrounded by so many of his supporters and his family? I mean, he changed the constitution and there are many who believe that he shouldn't be running for president again, that he, he's not legally in a position for re-election? Yes, I mean, certainly it is unprecedented. The, the Constitution was changed, the 18th Amendment was brought in with a purchased two-thirds majority. And, um, and uh, he abolished the term limit, as uh, the, the, the introduction mentioned. And now he's got an all-clear from a totally politicized uh, Supreme Court. So it does not apply. I mean, it is a strange country to live in because uh, the rule of law uh, is something that you read about uh, or say it, we used to have a rule of law. So it is, the context is very different from what it used to be, say, you know, 10 years ago uh, or even five years ago. So the, the, the other issue is who is he beleaguered? He said, uh, Rajiva said, that he is cornered, he's beleaguered. But by whom? Who are these people who's keeping him against his wishes? It's his own brothers and his own family. So I don't think it's been done, uh, you know, without the express knowledge or of the, the president. I mean, he's part of this whole thing. I don't agree that he's been used. Uh, I think he's doing it on his own. He, he, he has the support of his brothers. He wants to do this. His brothers are supporting him. His sons are supporting him. They're getting it done, or they're trying to get it, they're trying to get it done. So, so I don't necessarily agree that, uh, that, that the president is being forced to do things that he doesn't want to do. I don't think that's the case. I think he wants to do it. 
Um, OK, so you spoke a lot about his family. So I'm going to jump in here quickly and let's look at his family and look at the man in question, Mahinda Rajapaksa. He was born in the rural south and in 1970 became the youngest member of parliament at the age of 24. He went on to become prime minister and then president, narrowly winning elections in 2005. Rajapaksa was re-elected with 60% of votes cast in 2010 after being credited with ending the decades-long separatist war with the Tamil Tigers, he rewrote the constitution, we've been talking about this, to give himself sweeping powers over all aspects of government. He holds Sri Lanka's defence and finance portfolios, as well as those of ports, highways and aviation, while other members of his immediate family also serve as government ministers. Sir, I mean, his family's basically tied up every important portfolio, something like 94 departments come under the control of the family. I mean, it's not a healthy looking scenario, is it? it definitely not. I mean, again, going back to Rajiva's argument about as if um, President Rajapaksha is innocent and everybody else is um, the reason why uh, he's now forced to call an elections. Um, he, Rajapaksha brought the 18th Amendment, which gave, gave him the executive presidency almost um, like almost like a dictator, dictatorial powers through constitution. It's Rajapaksha who is the commander in chief who is accused of uh, committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. And some people accuse him of going to a genocidal, um, uh, to, to an extent of genocidal against the Tamil community. As head of state, he has immunity against the international law, um, but that's what he thinks. Um, however, the day that he is beaten in an election and he is not the head of head of state. The, just as what happens to happen to uh, Charles Taylor or Milosevic or people like that who committed genocidal crimes and uh, uh, breached international law, Rajapaksha will be taken by the International Criminal Court and will be charged against um, uh, for committing war crimes. All right, let's one bring last in... point about Rajiva. He okay. said, just, just one, one, one point, Jane, just one point. Uh, Rajiva said the military fought almost a clean war. I just wondered, 140 or thousand people dead, white flag, Sarandis dead, pictures to show, videos to show that uh, handcuffed, uh, blindfolded men and women sexually abused and killed, um, child of 11-year-old uh, children are being uh, killed. Is that, uh, is that a kind of thing that you call a, a relatively clean war? Um, what is international law? What is war crimes? What is crimes against humanity? I presume, I, I, I really do mean, um, I hope that Rajiva will go back and reflect on what he said. OK, Rajiva, uh, several points made there. Do you foresee your president heading off yes, to the no, International Criminal the, Court in the Hague any time soon? Time. And you just wonder you know, what sort of person is going to be ta able to take him out of power so that he, he gets there? <laughs> Well, as I said, you know, there's, I mean, just as Ronald Reagan said years ago to Wandale, there you go again. And the problem with people like Surin is by putting up uh, arguments that the majority of Sri Lankans think are complete nonsense. Well, uh, I have to say that the international community Mahindra might agree with a lot of what Surin had to say. I'm not it's, concerned uh, it's with the prejudices and of the international community. I have pointed out already on several occasions that the blanket charges being made uh, are actually what has polarized our society to a great extent. Now, I'm not excusing things, but I'm explaining things. And I think you have to understand that one of the reasons Mahindra Rajapaksa feels beleaguered is that after he won the war, there was an immediate attempt to pin war crimes on him. And this had been going on him be long before. Now, when you have statements to say, you know, it's essential to defeat Mahindra Rajapaksa in order to take him to The Hague, you're actually trying to ask the Sri Lankan people whether or not they think it's a better thing that Sri Lanka is without the Tigers or not. Now, I think we had an LLRC which actually produced an excellent report which most people, bar three, and I won't get into the details, thought was something we should work on. And I think it's regrettable that we didn't work on them uh, the couple of the points that are substantiated that uh, Suren talked about are brought up in the LLRC, 
and I think it's a great pity that the government did not go into those questions, but I think this whole nonsense of 140,000, which is not based on any evidence at all except figures which the UN itself have said were exaggerated, uh, because of the, the figures on which we, I was Secretary of the Ministry of Disaster Management and Human Rights, and, uh, you and, know, the and it's UN often and rather hard getting on uh, factual evidence on the ground, isn't it, when you've got some of the activists of and the with NGOs being arrested? It's precisely the type of nonsense that will actually uh, lead to what I think might be an undesirable result in this election. I think it's important to concentrate on some of the points you made and which Harsha made, which is that there is a real fear amongst a lot of Sri Lankans that there's a lot of nepotism. I myself have been writing a review, which is being published in the Sri Lankan papers, of something called Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And seven, you know, half those dwarfs are members of the family who I think are leading him to destruction. I didn't say he was being forced by other people. I said that they have blockaded him because it's very easy for someone who has been in power for a long time to have his ears shut to what is going on around him. We found the same sort of thing happening to Margaret Thatcher, if you remember, obviously in a very different way. So I think one of the things we have to be very and clear about is why is it that we would like the Sri Lankan people to have a change? And I think that is very, very different from the type of extraordinary, extreme allegation made by uh, people like Soren. And I hope that uh, the GTF will have the sense not to try to interfere in this election because they will pervert it. Ahasha, you've been desperate to jump in there. I mean, uh, quite incredible sort yeah. of accusations levelled there. I want to add to that the, the clamping down of press freedom that we've been seeing and allegations of vote rigging in the last elections. Is it going to be different yeah. this time? Yeah, see, I mean, I'm neither going to agree with uh, Suren nor with... Uh, there are all kinds of allegations and... Uh, uh, the government has been saying, no, nothing happened, zero casualties and so on. So they seem to be uh, extreme. What, what we should have done uh, is to have a credible domestic investigation. And that is what was being pushed for a number of years. And the government just kept backtracking and you know, not getting it done. Now we are cornered and the government will need to face uh, the music. Uh, but leave that aside, uh, we have to appreciate, even though I'm an opposition uh, member of parliament, that, uh, that terrorism is no longer a threat here. And, 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 and many people, both from the present government and from our party, uh, have attempted uh, to, to rid terrorism uh, in Sri Lanka. So, so that we must park. And we have to go forward now. You know, it is not winning the war. It is winning the peace. We have to live together. And what Suren is saying is correct, that we are fighting amongst the communities sponsored by extremist groups that are, are, are connected to the government. We had uh, riots uh, in Muslim burnt uh, churches. That's not on. We can't uh, go on as a country, as a civilized society, if we don't stop these things from happening. And the very, very powerful brother of the president uh, seem to be sanctioning some of these things. And I say seem to be because there isn't any you know, hard evidence to prove, but there is enough substantial evidence to say that, look, you know, th there is a strong connection. So denials are not sufficient. The government must uh, stop uh, this uh, in its tracks right now. But what is happening is people have realized they're not able to do it. Either they're not willing to do it, to do it, I don't know. They are unable to do it. So therefore, that is one of the main reasons we need to change this regime and bring a, bring a government uh, that can unite the Sinhalese, Tamils and the Muslims of this country. It seems that there's obviously a lot to fight for in Sri Lanka. Thank you for picking your way through the issues raised by this call for snap elections.
gentlemen. In Colombo, we had Rajiva Wajasina. In Dublin, Surin Surendran. And also in Colombo, Harsha De Silva. Thank you very much for talking to us. On Inside Story, we'd obviously like to hear from you. So why not post your comments at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or contact us on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. I'm Jane Dutton. Thank you very much for watching.